I will talk about reconfigurable intelligent surfaces, myths and realities. And I'm Emil Björnsson, I'm an associate professor at Linköping University in Sweden. So what is a reconfigurable intelligent surface? Well, let's start with a standard surface, a metal plate. When a signal is coming into its surface, it will bounce off it in a particular direction, which is determined by Snell's law. So as you can see here, it's the same angle that goes in, that it then will go out again. And that is because this is a coherent surface. Everything works the same everywhere. It has a constant surface impedance. A reconfigurable intelligent surface is something built on a meta surface concept where we can alter the impedance along the surface and in that way we can uh, determine when a signal comes in, in which direction will it bounce off. And that is following what's called the generalized Snell's law. And these different colors here is showing the different phase shifts that the signals are uh, subject to at different parts of the surface. And you see that it changes in such a way that the signal bounces off in a particular direction. And in reality, we can't have a continuous variations in the impedance, but instead we divide this surface into small subparts, size 7 and 10 or smaller, say lambda over 5 times lambda over 5. And each of them, we have a constant value of the surface impedance. And by controlling that value, we can select that for a particular signal coming in from an angle. It bounces off in another particular angle. So that is the main meta surface concept. So from the beginning, this was something that was used in fixed reflect arrays, which ba goes back to the 1960s. And you can see an example here where a signal is coming in and then it gets focused on a particular point. So this is a bit like a satellite receiver, but we don't have a parabolic surface. Instead, we have something that is flat and where it's divided into these different pieces, which we can control in such a way that the signal is getting focused on a particular point. Later, the concept of reconfigurable reflect arrays or meta surfaces appeared where we can control uh, these different uh, elements, which we call meta atoms and later software control, we can even control them using software. And what people are nowadays considering in this reconfigurable intelligent surface concept is a real-time software controlled meta surface. So as you can see here, the idea is that we have an RF transmitter that sends a signal and the signal doesn't reach the user one here directly, but it reaches the meta surface and we control it uh, in such a way that the signal is getting reflected towards the use of interest. And then we can in real time change it so instead the signal will now be reflected towards another user, user 2 here. This is the main idea of reconfigurable intelligent surfaces, that we're going to use them, put them out in the environment to improve the channel. And people can't really stop making up new names for this concept. So in addition to reflect arrays, Software control meta surface have been used, reconfigurable intelligent surfaces, as in the title of this talk, intelligent reflecting surfaces. And in my recent overview paper, we are mentioning all of these ones and even more examples. And in the remainder of this talk, I will call it intelligent reflecting surface because I think that is telling the most of what it is. It is a surface that is intelligent in the sense that we can control it. And what can we control? Well, it's reflective conditions. And this is not a specular reflection in general, but reflection in a wider sense. How is an incoming signal going to bounce off it? And this is an exciting idea from a communication perspective because we can create intelligent propagation environments. So look at this setup here where we have a source that is communicating with a destination and the signal that goes directly between them is blocked so it's very weak. And what we can conventionally do is just to control what we do at the source and control what we do at the destination. So we can try to encode the signal with a low coding rate and try to do as much processing as possible at the receiver side to bring the signal back. But what we can instead do when we are considering meta services is that we put them up and we get an additional propagation path via this surface. So we can control how the channel behaves. And this is an exciting idea, this type of intelligent programmable uh, propagation environments. The question is, is this really a game changer or is it just on a conceptual level? And what I'm going to focus on in this talk is some of the myths that have appeared in this area, which 
makes you uh, believe that things are possible that might not be possible in reality. So the first myth is that the, this is the first technology to control the channel. So using this intelligent reflecting surface, you see here we send a signal from a source to a destination and it goes via this surface containing n small reflecting elements, which we can control each of them. And we have beta sr as the path loss between the source and the surface and beta rd from the uh, surface to the destination, to, from each of the elements. And assume that this blockage is so severe that we can't re even count on the source of destination here. Well, have you seen a setup like this before? Well, this is actually a classical relaying setup where we would consider it exactly the same scenario, except that we don't have a surface with n reconfigurable elements that reflect them. We have a relay. Say that we have a decoder and forward relay that obtains the signal and then retransmits it later to destination. And let's compare these different cases. The spectral efficiency that we are getting with an intelligent reflecting surface, since the signal gets reflected, we get the signal power uh, rho in this example that we transmit from the source and then n of it is being received at the surface. So we get n times beta sr. Then we get the beam forming gain from the surface towards the destination if we configure it properly. So we get another factor n, but we are losing beta rd on the way to the destination. So we get this spectral efficiency log 2 or 1 plus rho n square beta sr beta rd. And the good thing with this one is that we have no pre-log factor as you would have in a relay channel. We have to first transmit the relay and then later to the destination. But what is the problem here is that we have the multiplication between two channel gains, two beta terms. And if these ones are, say, minus 70 dB in a good case, then if you multiply two of them, we get minus 140. So this gives us a very poor channel gain. But we have the multiplication with n squared as well. If we compare this with a typical decode and forward relay, we get a 1 over 2 in front of the logarithm because we first transmit from the source to the relay and then from the relay to the destination. Inside the logarithm we get 1 plus rho, same transmit power, but the minimum of the two path losses, the two beta sr and beta rd. So the good thing is this signal amplification that happens in the relay, so we don't get the product but the worst of the two channel gains. However, the bad thing is the prelog factor. So even if intelligent reflecting surfaces are not the first way of controlling the channel, is it better than relays? That is what we're considering here, where a source transmits to a destination. And 80 meters horizontally from the source, there is an IRS or relay that supports the transmission. And 10 meters below, we have a destination, which we are moving using the variable D1. When D1 is zero, we are close to the source. When D1 is 80, we are close to the IRS or relay. And we will move it and look at the performance. And we try to achieve four bits per second per hertz. And we use some typical 3 dpp channel models, as you can see here. Then what you can see in the figure is that the upper curve is a sizer system. So the source transmits to destination. And there is a bad non-line of sight channel there. So it uses the most power irrespective of where the destination is. Then if we have the decode and forward relay, we get the lowest curve there, the blue one. Uh, so that one requires the least power to receive the signal, uh, which is 4 bits per second per hertz. And then what you can see in the different red curves is with 25 elements, 50 elements, 100 and 200 elements. And when we come down to 200 elements, well, if the user is close to the IRS, then we actually beat the relay. So the conclusion here is that a metasurface definitely outperforms a sizer case with no relay, but we need say 200 elements in this example to beat the relay. So we need large uh, IRSs in order to beat it. On the other hand, say that we operate in 3 gigahertz spectrum here, then 200 elements can fit into one meter times half a meter. So it's not that large if you are imagining putting this up on the wall and hiding it behind the wallpaper or something like that. The second myth is that the beam forming gains are better than in massive MIMO. So say that we look at now this spectral efficiency expression, 1 plus rho n square beta sr beta rd that we had inside uh, the logarithm. Then since we have n square, 
This received power increases with the square of the number of elements. And compare that with the massive MIMA system, where we only say we transmit from the same location as the IRS are. So we cut out the source entirely and we just transmit to the same destination. Then the power would only grow with n. And n squared is better than n, right? Well, the problem is that if you take this as now expression that you get with the IRS, we can factor it up into a first part, uh, rho n beta r d. This is the SNR that the massive MIMA system would get. And then we have a second factor, n times beta SR. That is the fraction of the power that comes from the source that actually reaches the IRS. And we can never reach uh, it with more than the full power, factor one here. So that means that we will always have worse SNR. Uh, when we are working with an IRS. Even if, as you can see in this graph here, when we increase the number of antennas or elements on the horizontal axis, and we look at the total channel gain. The red curve is what we get with massive MIMO. The uh, blue and black curve here is showing what is happening uh, with the IRS. And it starts at a much, much lower number because of the multiplication of the betas. Then it increases with a higher slope, but when it would have crossed the red line, what actually happens is that we will uh, enter the near field and therefore it will start to converge. We need to use another expression like than this one in order to get the accurate results. So an IRS can, will always have worse SNR than the massive mind, but the gap reduces with the number of antennas, but it will always remain. The third and final myth is that an IRS works as a specular reflector, an anomalous mirror, which means that uh, the signal goes in, if it's a plane wave, we will have an exactly a plane wave that goes out again. And for example, people have been claiming that if you just have a surface that is 10 lambda times 10 lambda large, it will behave like this. But if you simulate it, you see that it's not the case. This figure is showing the path loss or channel gain in different observation angles when the incoming wave is a plane wave with 60 degrees angle. And then we see that the scattered wave also have its largest value at 60, but if it were a plane wave that was going out, then we will only have something at that angle. Here we see a lot of power at other angles as well. In particular, if we look at the blue curve, which is a 10 lambda times 10 lambda plate, then we have a 36 degrees beam width here. And even if you go up to a 50 times 50 lambda, you still have a beam width. So this is natural. We always know that when we are working with an antenna array, the larger it is, the more narrow the beams are, but the, the beam width will always be inversely proportional to the length of the array. So what can trick us here is that when we look ourselves in a mirror, we are working in visible light, which have a wavelength that is 100,000 times shorter than in wireless communication, which means that uh, if we would like to see the same behaviors in radio spectrum as we see in visible light, we will need to have a 100,000 times larger surface. Is it any way helpful to interpret it as a mirror? Well, look at this example here where we have a source that transmits to destination and the signal is reflected towards the user. And if it behaves as a mirror, we can just move the user to a location that is behind the mirror instead, take away the mirror and compute the path loss as, that, as if that would have been the case. So you just sum up the two distances and get this channel gain mirror limit as you can see. And do we see that in reality? Well, what happens here, we see the number of elements in the iris and the total channel gain. There are four curves in this figure. We have the horizontal line, which is the mirror limit. Then we have the black curve, which is the IRS operated to mimic a mirror. And then we have the blue curve when we have optimized the IRS to maximize the SNR. And when we have a small IRS, we are operating in the far field and then mimicking a mirror, computing the phase shifts as if we would like this to operate as a mirror. That is optimal. That is what we are, are getting. The same thing as with a mathematical optimized setup. But eventually we reach this mirror limit and then we move into the near field. And in those cases, it's grossly suboptimal to operate it as a mirror. This is logarithmic scale. So we can have a thousand times better channel gain when we have a hundred times hundred element array here. And in those cases, 
what should we interpret an iris is? Well, an iris is not the mirror, it is a lens. So if you have an omnidirectional source to transmit the signal towards uh, the iris and then you optimize its operation, well then the signal will be focused at the point of the receiver. So all the scattered waves have faced the line at this point. It is like a lens. And that is what we will see in the near field. And it's the same thing as a satellite receiver that takes a signal and focuses it on one point. And if we then move this destination into the far field, well, the signal will be more and more focused towards the user uh, with beam forming like behaviors. But it's still a lens array that we are creating here. So finally, what are then the use cases that I believe in, given all this myth that surrounds this technology? Well, I think that in cases where it's complicated to build a big array, then we can have one destination and we can have a big meta surface that is taking the signal that comes into it and reflects it towards the location of the user. This could be a new way of building hybrid transceivers. And uh, this is also resembling a lot the satellite receiver that we already have. And if we even put this destination inside of the surface, then this is what is called holographic beamforming. When the signal are reaching the surface, then it gets phase shift inside of it, and then it goes to the baseband. Another operation that I believe in is that when we move above 100 gigahertz, it might be very hard to build conventional digital arrays. And in particular, also the channels become sparser and sparser. So if our direct signal is blocked, well, then it's important to create new propagation paths. And since there's very little scattering in those cases naturally, by putting up a surface like this, we can provide an additional path. It might be a weak one, but it might be also what we need in order to make the system work at all. And finally, what are then the open problems in a system like this? Well, one thing is to even make this work, to have a control interface, including channel estimation, so we can estimate the location of the user and uh, focus the signal towards it. If you want to do this in real time, well, it will be very complicated to implement it because we cannot make a measurement inside the surface, but another point. So we need to send some kind of training signals to learn it, and then we need to have a control interface to tell the surface how should we operate it. And finally, I also still looking for the game changing use cases of something like this. Something that can, that can improve our performance with 10 times or something like that. We saw that beating a relay might not be so very easy. And if we, if we have gains, they might not be so large. We need to demonstrate something that can provide us with huge gains if we should actually be willing to invest all the time and resources into turning this technology into a real 